people to talk again. Um, so, um, I am Greg Dukes. I work for Bristol Community Health, who are the adult community health care provider for the Bristol region, although we do have some services in South Gloucestershire as well. Um, I work in the patient and public empowerment team, um, which consists of myself and Matthew, who some of you might know, Matthew Arascog. Um, we are currently, um, one big piece of work which we're involved in is the patient leadership program, which is about training patient leaders um, across the Bristol area, at the moment Bristol, um, to become kind of empowered in their care, um, not just with regards to what they receive from Bristol Community Health, but from the wider Bristol network of healthcare providers. Um, so hopefully those of you from Bristol are already aware of this project. I know some of you are coming to um, the meeting we're having on the 15th of May um, to kind of like flesh out the details of this a bit more because it's only just started as a project really. Um, so that's, that's our kind of like big piece of work we're doing at the moment, kind of bringing different healthcare organisations together to do some training for patients so patients can kind of be in the centre of their care is, is kind of the idea behind it. Um, that's our main thing. I mean, there's obviously mm. lots of other stuff I'd like to talk about, but yeah, that's our, like, that's our big project. Mm. Thank cool. you. So that's, that's a very clear initiative which crosses boundaries and, and others, um, perhaps particularly Martin, might want to ask you more about it in a moment. Um, Tara, are you there with us, even though we can't perhaps see you? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, that's all right, but you can see the slides, can you? Yeah, and I can see uh, you and Tony. So, and can, um, and can, you can see the slides too on the, yes, the main can, screen, yeah. Yes. Okay, anything else you'd like to say, I think, particularly perhaps to Martin, who I guess doesn't know you, um, about what you've written there in front of you? Sorry, who else is here apart Yes, oh, we haven't done introductions properly. We're doing them as we go along. But okay. um, So, um, Greg, you've just heard from yourself, Tara. Tony Jones, you know very well from Bristol. Yes. And Martin, who will introduce himself shortly, won't you, Martin? Um, Martin Webster, um, who is the manager of Healthwatch Dorset. Okay, all right then. Yeah. Hello, um, Martin. Yes, um, I'm, um, yes, I'm Tara Mystery. I'm a lay member for patient public involvement on the Bristol CCG governing body. Um, I've had many years um, involved as a non-exec and so on, uh, leading on things like PPI inequalities. Um, so that's kind of a bit of my background, health and social care, education and that kind of thing. So um, I suppose uh, beyond um, what I've written, I don't have much more to say. Except That's okay. <laughs> I've got a role at the moment as a lay member facilitator, which is a new role created by NHS England, and the eight of us have been appointed in that role to help us as lay members for PPI work more effectively, um, you know, prioritise things that are... CCG really needs to do around uh, patient public involvement because we're all working in sort of our disparate ways. So that that new role makes me want to obviously be much more um, clearer about what we're doing, and and that you know that I think does has helped me focus a bit more on um, how I want to use these networks and dialogue I'm having across Bristol, but also the stuff I'm involved with nationally, how we can kind of help to systematize some of that mm. um, for more effective, you know, work in the future. Well, thank you, Tara. And just, just to um, clarify, perhaps for the sure. others anyway, that so in the south of England, big area, there's three of you with this additional responsibility as um, network facilitators. And in, in Dorset, do, do, do you have a bit of a patch? Does one of your colleagues yes, I cover think, Dorset? Yes, I think it will be um, um, a guy called Dave Nelson who, who might be covering that patch. And they're all they're all currently a CCG lay member anyway, so Dave is yeah, as well. Related yeah. to our roles, and there's a woman called Karen Mansell who's covering some of the briefs. The, the area I'm covering is the NSSG and Cornwall and Arles mm. Uh but there are going to be some overlaps. I don't think it matters around the geography as much as relationships, and if yeah. people have got those relationships, yeah, we'll try to support 
networks around that. But I think Dorset is a guy called David Nelson. Okay, and and he works of well, he obviously is a lay member of ACCG in that yeah, sort of southern to, central south area. Yeah. Do you remember where where he no. is? No, perhaps you could find out if Martin. Wants Isle to of White, yeah. Isle of White. Oh please. right, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, um, Tony. Tony Jones. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Tony Jones. I'm patient and public involvement manager at Bristol CCG, and. We've had a fairly long tradition in Bristol of the PPI workers from uh, commissioners, providers, and lastly, someone who's working on kind of health research coming together. It started way back when we were having a big um, um, acute services reorganisation. So we're quite used to working as workers across different organisations. Um, so that's what we've been doing to date and I think what I'm quite interested in as we come on in the conversation is how organisations do that and I'm quite interested to explore um, the Health and Wellbeing Board and whether it might have a role in that but I'll leave that to later in the conversation. Mm. Mm. Thank you Tony and finally Martin who, with whom I've spoken on the phone and in fact this, this, um, this seminar or the rather this discussion today came from my conversation with Martin. Um, who I think we both got quite excited over the phone, didn't we, Martin? So over to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, yes, we did get rather, rather excited, Martin. You're right. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Martin Webster. As Martin has said, I'm manager of Health Watch um, Dorset. Um, and before that, I was involved in the two predecessor mechanisms to Health Watch, uh, links to the local involvement networks and the PPI forums. Um, before them, um, I do remember community health councils, but I, I didn't, I didn't work for one, although I certainly knew about them and had involvement with them because I was then working in the voluntary sector as well. Um, so, as you know, HealthWatch, um, both HealthWatch England and local HealthWatch are sort of new players in the system, if you like, but um, in the sense I just talked about, we've also got history, you know, like CCGs, um, PCTs before them and so on. Um, but I think one of the things that we're still trying to work through in local health watch is really where we where we fit into the system and sort of interested in what Tony was just saying about health and wellbeing boards because you'll see the sort of one bullet point, as it were, that I've um, offered to um, get us going from, from our perspective, something that we're really interested in is, is the health and wellbeing boards uh, as potentially a very important new part of the system. I think they, like all the rest of us, are still trying to um, find their feet, really, um, uh, um, flex their muscles uh, and see how influential uh, they can be. But um, uh, Local Health Watch is one of the uh, sort of statutory minimum members of of each health and wellbeing board, um, and I think uh, that's something that's going to be really interesting to see what we can bring to that table, if you like. Now, in Dorset, we have a particular situation as well because um, Health Watch Dorset uh, covers three local authorities. Uh, we're one of only two local health watch in the country uh, that sort of cover more than one local authority area. Uh, so, for us, uh, the local authorities of Dorset and Poole and Bournemouth have commissioned Health Watch um, together. Uh, and that actually involves two health and well-being boards, the Dorset Board and the Joint Bournemouth and Poole Board. So that's a very interesting thing for us as well, especially as, uh, as we all know, um, lots of organisations, particularly local authorities, are looking at you know, how they might join together and make efficiencies and join together back office functions and things like that. Um, and we're all talking about integration and how we can work more closely together. So that's one of the things I think I'm particularly interested in, um, in in terms of system leadership, how health and wellbeing boards, because they bring together so many crucial players around the table, you know, how going forward um, they might be um, a progressive force, if you like. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin. So as both you and Tony have talked quite a bit there about the um, health and wellbeing board. Um, I'm going to just see if there's any questions either way round from, you know, those two communities, Dorset and Bristol, that you want to ask, just about facts and status quo. If there isn't, we'll move straight on to saying, what do we want to be different? You know, what, how could we change that? What's our so vision? Just, um, but any questions first, just brief ones. Yeah, Tara. Um, it's Tara here. Um, I just want to clarify, for, for us in Bristol, um, Healthwatch also has contracts with local authority in um, Somerset, and Bath mm. and South Gloucester. Is that right, Tony? 
that yes, they cover yes. those local authorities. So our health watch model is one that encompasses more than one one CCG and one local authority. It's, it's so only, that... We have that dimension as well. And just, just maybe just to mm. clarify that I sit on Bristol Health Watch Advisory Group as a lay member from my CCG, and they're using that model across the patch. Uh, whether it's right or wrong or not, I'm not sure, but at the moment that's the model that's been used. That's just to help Martin just understand the layout of Health Watch in the mm -hmm. um, 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 Yeah, and perhaps it's Martin in Dorset. Um, and perhaps actually uh, that's really interesting because to that I can add that um, actually the organisation that employs me, um, we're involved in seven local health watch. So, I mean, I think what you're talking about in Bristol, you're talking about um, the Care Forum. Yes. That's yes. an organisation that's got a number of contracts. And my employer is a charity called Health and Care, and uh, we are part of a consortium in seven local health watch, um, mostly in the southeast. Uh, Dorset's the only one in the southwest. Um, and in our case, we're saying each of those seven, we're part of a consortium. And our common partner in all of them uh, is the local citizens' advice bureaus. Oh, okay. So um, I think that that's, that's quite interesting, isn't it, that both both of us on this conversation, as it were, have got some, you know, and it's that thing about collaboration I was talking about a minute ago, isn't it? It's very much um, collaboration, networking, uh, uh, relationships and so on, very much the name of the game at the moment and perhaps the way forward for all of us. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Just Can I just check that Citizens Advice Bureau part then? Is, is that with your larger community interest? organization that the yes, CAB because, yes I mean uh, I'm not going mm. into too much detail mm. for you all with it but um, uh, you know uh, um, uh, local health watch um, but they aren't statutory bodies so their they're, they're sort of detailed governance isn't set down but the only thing that's really set down uh, to be common with each local health watch is they have to be a social enterprise and there's a very loose definition for that of what social enterprise means and the seven that our organisation is involved in, in fact, are all, each of them, separate, uh, new, newly founded community interest companies. Mm -hmm. and, and in each of them, for instance, Health and Care, my employer, and the Local Citizens Advice Bureau, um, we are members of those CICs, if you like, and we have um, uh, 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 member-nominated directors on those mm -hmm. boards, mm -hmm. joined by a number of uh, independently appointed uh, non-executive directors. So it's sort of about um, trying to build in those organisations, but also to build in some um, distance and some independence, uh, and to let those, uh, uh, you know. So I think actually that that model with the Care Forum in um, Bristol and um, uh, Bath and North East Somerset mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, I think that's rather different in that there's a much closer um, identifiable relation between the organisation that actually was awarded the contract and the delivery of the local health watch. Mm -hmm. For us, what we've done is come together and have created entirely new entities. Uh, uh, that was the model that we chose anyway. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, so they are different. Um, and can I just check in the Bristol area, the role of Citizens Advice, is it just one of many organisations? It doesn't have a special role, does it? Uh, it's Tony here, Martin. CAB. Do you mean mm. um, CAB. with relation to Health Watch? To um, the formal structures like Health Watch, yeah. It doesn't have any formal relation to Health Watch. No, no, I didn't think so. Mm. Any questions? Um, I, that, that was a question from Tara just about how it works. Any, any other questions before we move on to some discussion? No. 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 Okay, great. Well, when you emailed me yesterday and today, the day before, thank you for that. Um, very briefly, this is this, these these were the phrases you put down here, and I've been reading through. You haven't you haven't seen them collectively, so there's a chance for you just to see the uh, the areas that you said you'd be interested in covering in the next 45 minutes or so. Um, and I can see very clearly that some of this some of the conversation needs to be about leadership and Martin mentioning models of leadership as well. Um, and Greg very helpfully has put in a, a kind of request for us also to talk about um, sharing the, the many items of data and information and patient experience that we separately receive in our different organizations, providers as well as others, um, and how we can use that more efficiently, uh, more powerfully as well. So that's a sort of how question which if, if we had um, somebody who was, as it were, 
a patient representative here on the call, they might say, well, of course, that's the whole point. I don't care about the leadership. It's why am I telling you something and it's not getting through to somebody else. So it, from a patient's perspective, Greg's questions, I feel quite central. Um, but from our perspective as, you know, professionals working in the field, I think the leadership one is also um, perhaps part of the quest answer of how we move forward to do that. So um, I'm just thinking, where do we want to start? Do we want to start with the the, the leadership aspects, maybe, or the aspect that Greg's kind of come in on? Any views? I'd go with Greg myself. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess mine is kind of like, like you say, part of the, it's like a specific part of the whole thing, really, isn't it? So you've yeah. got the leadership, which is like all-encompassing, but like one practical element of that. Mm. It's just that, like, it's a small part of the puzzle. It's just that, you know, we do events. We obviously gather a whole lot of feedback through a whole lot of different ways. Mm. And often the feedback we'll be getting will be related to other parts of the system. And it would be nice to have, like, a more formal process for mm. sharing this and making sure that, like, so if a patient says to me, oh, you know, my doctors never do such and such, or my, I was in the hospital and I found that it was actually quite mm. a hostile environment in this particular ward, that I can feed that to someone and also make sure that the patient is aware of the process that's going on behind the scenes mm. and gets the information they need, either mm. from me or from a middle body or whatever. I mean, yeah. I, I guess there are like organisations like Healthwatch, like you say, which are able to do that well, to some extent, yeah. but it does take a bit longer with Healthwatch. Well, let's explore that, shall we, for a bit. And, and, and I'll just add a piece of information or a conversation I had with um, one of the engage there are two engagement leads for CQC in the south of England. Uh, I met one of them, um, and I thought, oh, you know, I was very very open about the conversation. We want to, she's new in post, um, and of course they do come CQC come in for a lot of criticism. Um, so, for example, on their website, you, you could record a view or a comment, whether they're doing an inspection or not. You could just go to their website now. Um, and it sometimes looks a bit wishy-washy as to how they'll respond. They say, well, we're not responsible for it, um, but we might pass it on. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but we might pass it on, um, but we don't take any responsibility after that. Um, yeah. Maybe because they don't think they can. Um, and I suppose that's... Again, that to me, that that's um, demonstrating some of the potential problems that organisations either create or or, um, or display in terms of feeling responsible for the whole health system to the one patient who doesn't care which bit they're from. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's another way of sort of explaining the problem, perhaps. Have we got any views from anybody um, on? where they've seen it work a little bit or what a vision of that might be? Can I come in there, with, um, Martin and Dorset? Yes, um, uh, Greg, if, if you were um, in Dorset and saying that, I would by now have bitten your hand off mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because I think that's absolutely um, a sort of place where we're trying to position local health watch. In the sense of that, um, actually now the sort of um, consultation, feedback, engagement pool has become extremely crowded. I mean, all of you, are, you know, who are, are in public bodies have got a duty to involve a consultant and so on, and really everybody's got, got a duty now, haven't they, in some way or other, to find out what, what people think and so on and so forth. So, I mean, as I put in one of my bullet points, um, for me an analogy I very often use is, is the jigsaw. So, you know, that sort of evidence that you're talking about, which is people's experiences, that sort of, you know, that, those are some of the pieces of the jigsaw. And we've got some of the pieces of the jigsaw, and the CCG has, and um, the, the trust have, and so on and so forth. And, and what's sort of missing, one of the things that's missing, um, is that those pieces of the jigsaw never actually put together to build the, the whole picture. So we've each got, you know, and including the CQC and lots of other bodies, we've each got sort of part of the picture, but it's, it's never put together. And one of the things that we're interested in is whether Health Watch can, local Health Watch, can sort of act as the place where, where all that is aggregated, if you like. So we're always sort of offering a deal to other organisations saying, if you share with us, we'll share with you. Um, if you know what I mean, and we'll try and 
build that knowledge because if we put all that consultation and data and evidence together and some of it's quantitative and some of it's qualitative but if we put it all together uh, we're all going to get a much richer picture aren't we uh, of uh, what's really going on and what it's really like for people can i just come in a bit um tara here um I'm quite interested in kind of Tony's view about health and well-being board being, uh, you know, where the, some of the work and leadership stuff around coordinating this can happen. Because I think the problem with um, health watch models across the country is they do vary enormously and their capacity varies enormously. Uh, and... I think from what you're saying, Martin, in Dorset, you've got a much better grip of your role and, you know, your kind of independence and so on. But my impression, talking to particularly lay members across the country, some of them there have, some of the CCGs have very little involvement with their health watch. Uh, they may have more involvement through the health and wellbeing boards, but not separately. I think we've got quite a good relationship, but the problem I have with Healthwatch being the system leader, if you like, around this is that they are so variable. If there was a bit more consistency in their capacity and their approach, then I, I can see that that would be really, really useful That they'd because they've got that independence that the others haven't. Um, so for, for me in Bristol, the model of sort of the health and well-being board taking some of that that control if it was you know if you like the you know the stuff that Greg, greg's talked about the things that you've talked about but as a conduit and having a kind of legitimate role then i'd be quite interested in exploring that so i'm being a bit of a devil's advocate here but i'm just wondering what people think about that mm. can i come in there martin it's tony of course yeah um, before I pick up that bit about health and wellbeing board, I just wanted to respond to to Martin and Greg and the talk uh, that, that discussion about sort of collecting and bringing together data that we know. And this might be a bit of a dissenting voice, but I think one of the problems, one of the traps we can fall into and have fallen into, and certainly in Bristol we've fallen into it, is that you can spend a lot of money, time, and effort in trying to collect patient experience data, uh, involvement data from across a range of organizations, putting it together, uh, keeping it up to date, and all that kind of thing. And there's been, at least, there's been at least one failed attempt in Bristol to do some kind of library of information. And the problem, mm -hmm. I think, what that does for the NHS particularly, is it's a very, and this might be a bit cynical of me, it's a very neat way of avoiding doing things in terms of responding to what people want in terms of change because you can put a lot of energy and money into creating these libraries of intelligence or databases and, you, and it looks very good and you put all this money into it but actually at the end of the day you haven't actually done anything um, in response to what people tell us about what they need from the NHS and I think actually we don't need lots more data about what people need from the NHS. We know that fairly well. There's massive amounts of data out there. Um, what the NHS isn't good at is just doing it, just responding. So personally, I think I would be wary about going down routes which put a lot of time and effort into data collection. I'm much more interested in what is stopping organizations individually and collectively acting on what we already know. And that's where I could go on later to talk about that leadership role of the Health and Wellbeing Board, but I'll stop just there. Hmm. So, um, thank you. Can I can I just sort of, uh, not exactly summarise, but the way I saw what Martin was saying there, I think it was Martin, perhaps Tara as well, but um, was that it's almost as though the Health and Wellbeing Board could commission a responsibility um, that Health Watch might take up, or might in your case, because you sound very progressive, Martin, um, to do that sharing, um, taking information, making sure it goes to the right place. Is that is that one way of seeing it? I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but is that one model, if you like? Well, if, if I can pick up on what Tony was saying, which is yeah, something please that, do. that, we, please do, that yeah. we very much uh, recognise what you're saying, Tony, and I think for us it's that... Um, the whole thing is about a
process, and, 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 and a process that almost it, it, it is a wheel, if you like. It has, it, it, it's sort of self-perpetuating. It has no, no beginning or end. But, I mean, f from our perspective, if I can sort of be blunt, sometimes what we see in, um, not only in the NHS, but in local authorities as well, because, of course, Health Watch has a remit um, mm. for social care uh, as well as the NHS. What we very often see in public bodies is that you can ask questions, for instance, um, along the lines of, well, you know, uh, uh, do you involve and consult people? Uh, and when did you last do that? And how did you do that? And what did they tell you? And we might get answers to those questions. But when we go on to answer the um, next question that we want to and need to ask, which is around, and what have you learned from it? And how have you used it? And what have you done? And what have you changed? And how has it affected decisions you've taken? Then very often people begin to look rather shifty and remember that they've got um, a rather urgent appointment somewhere <laughs> else. So I think that actually, again, for me, as you'll see, I mean, obviously I work for Health Watch, so you'd rather expect me, but I'm beginning to sound a bit like a Health Watch nut as though it's the panacea mm -hmm. and the answer to everyone's problems. But, but I see that Health Watch can have a, a, a very important um, role there to hold people to, um, to account because we will very often, you know, it, uh, as Tony said, it's fine sort of collecting what people um, think and what their experiences are and so on. And what, what we want to do in local health watch is then say um, uh, uh, to and alongside uh, commissioners and providers and so on, okay, here it is, uh, what do you think and what are you going to do? Is that a vision? Is that a vision? It sounds a vision. <laughs> yes, and I think, you know, it, it's, I say, uh, for us, it's, uh, I mean, um, life is not black and white, is it? And uh, it, it, it's sort of quite, quite a complicated network of relationships, really. And for us, we've sort of got a dual role, both to hold the system, which is some of you guys, to account for how you fulfill your statutory obligations to involve and consult. But I think we've also got a role as Local Health Watch to support and enable and facilitate you to do that. So if I can give a particular example from mm. where we work in Dorset, uh, here in Dorset, uh, where we're very lucky in one sense that the whole of Dorset has just one CCG, third largest in the country, I think, Dorset CCG. Dorset CCG at the moment is undergoing a complete clinical services review. So the whole thing is sort of you know, under review, if you like. And the role that HealthWatch is um, playing in that is that we have regular catch-ups, if you like, with our colleagues directors in the, in the CCG. And most of all, we're talking to them about their plans for um, engagement and um, consultation, and I suppose we're really acting as a consultant, uh, an, mm -hmm. an unpaid um, consultant. And interestingly, if you like, um, the Dorset CCG has um, said to us and, and to the general public that they're sort of going to, how they will judge whether they think they've got their public consultation right is what Local Health Watch thinks. What they want is for it to be in a position whereby we will say, we think Dorset CCG has done as much as it could to involve uh, as many and as representative and as diverse mm -hmm. uh, a number of people in Dorset uh, in this uh, clinical services um, review. So I think there's, there's loads of opportunities about there. Uh, uh, and if we talk about leadership, I think you know we're all in the system, but we've all got our different our different places in the system, but I would hope that we would all want to be enablers uh, in the system and each bringing a different uh, value, if you like, and adding value to what each other is doing to help to mm. build up the whole. Thank you, Martin. Can I just, um, we're sort of usefully, I hope, dancing between the two, the two kind of major discussion areas we talked about, the, the as it were, the practicalities of the fact that the patient experience is something um, and there's a fairly impenetrable wall, um, if they are able to offer feedback, um, it might be going to the wrong place, as Greg said, but it sh shouldn't be seen as the wrong place. So, um, and, and then what you were most likely talking about, Martin, was um, using holding organisations to account. And your example was around the processes of engagement, wasn't it? Because there's a new, you know, uh, a review of services. Um, and I think what Greg... Greg was coming in at, you can correct me Greg if you like, was um, day to day we, there is patient experience captured, recorded, um, passed forward, um, but it, A, it doesn't always get to the right place and then B, which was the point which several of you picked up, um, we don't know whether anything happens as a result. So I'm kind of trying to break yeah. the conversation down into those 
those elements you know and and i haven't you know in yet let's let's talk about it if you wish um begun to hear how we would have a, a system a process that essentially means wherever i express my feedback it goes to the right place um, and, and that's not just down to Greg being at an, a meeting, is it, Greg, and writing an email afterwards and saying, oh, um, I've, one of your patients complained, you know, I'd just like to pass it on. Yeah, because really that's, that. that's, that's what I've done in the past. Sorry, yeah, it's Greg, very yeah. dependent on um, discretion and individuals. That doesn't feel... Yeah, it doesn't feel like an appropriate process. And I've, no, I've spoken to a patient no. and said, yes, we will then definitely try and solve your problem for you. But there's then confidentiality that, that issues, ends, all sorts of things. Yeah, that, and if yeah. that just ends at me sending an email across to yeah. someone, a, a, um, my equivalent in a different organisation, yeah, then it kind of feels like a bit of a um, non-process, like a, yeah, a no starter. Yeah. It's the leave it with me thing, which is which is really a very successful response to somebody. Um, so, but then you've got, let, let's let, let's keep moving between those two sets of ideas. You know, the leadership of the system and this very practical stuff around everyday data. Has anybody got any uh, ambitions or um, ideas from elsewhere, perhaps, where that could be handled in our multi-organisational, particularly providers, multi-organisational kind of communities? Any views or uh, thoughts from elsewhere? Uh, it's Tony here. I can give hmm. you one. Um, well, it's a sort of initiative, I suppose, in Bristol. Hmm. The um, Better Care programme had... Um, some, oh no, I know how it was. The Better Care Programme were wanting to see if you could collate information that was coming in from different sources, mm -hmm. um, particularly around health and social care for the kind of target group older people predominantly they're looking at. And they had some money left over from the setup of Health Watch, which the council had to spend before the end of the financial year. So effectively, they gave it to the Care Forum to do a piece of work on um, trying to. And that work, I think, is ongoing if people are interested in contacting the Care Forum about it, um, trying to bring this work together. The problem I have with that, and we had some debates at the beginning of this as to how to use it, I thought it would have been much more useful to have used that money to have involved citizens in co-designing the sorts of pathway changes we will have to make if better care is going to work. Um, but that that wasn't a majority view so it hasn't happened and I think that's a missed opportunity and it's going back to the point I made that I think there's still a lot of how can we just create systems and processes so we all know what's being said rather than involving people either responding to them for the change they want or involving them in a change process that's the bit that's not I don't know mm. what's happening I don't know you, that, you haven't seen any examples anywhere no, Tony I haven't seen any examples well, no no mm. I mean, I think there's, I, I'd love to just in a moment show you, if it works, um, a website which is from one organization being really responsive. And I'll do, uh, but that doesn't solve the problem of, you know, Greg hearing in Bristol Community Health something which needs to really be addressed by a GP, for example. But uh, if it works, I'll just share um, this with you, not that. Oops, there we are, that. Um, I presume you can see a website, and yeah. it is Birmingham Children's Hospital, and if you look at this, I mean, forget the advert on the left for an app, which is just another way of giving feedback to them. If you look on the right, I mean, I have to stop, you know, I have to get my hanky out in a minute, because if you see that feedback there, that's live Wednesday, that's this week, um, typed in on this website, I think. Um, from parents of Burma's Children's Hospital. And the big one in the middle is saying, uh, my son died this week, and this is what I want to tell you. And they want to tell the whole world. Well, they're not sure they want to tell the whole world, but they have, me, you, and the ward staff. And there's a reply from Janet. Um, and so on, as you scroll down. You can't scroll down, I don't think, but I can. Um, Positive, positive, but I did read one when I looked at it a few months ago um, about saying my son hasn't had his food properly. You know, he's been really badly treated. And they replied as well online here. Um, so I'll just go back to my... hope I can find you now. Um, 
you know, back to that. So, I mean, that's a really, I, I think that found that a really positive example of an individual organization dealing with that. We've heard you were doing something. Um, and I, I can't find anything to criticize about that. But it, but it does still leave us with this, um, we'll call it Greg's problem for now, Greg. <laughs> um, how do we, yeah, how do we show that action is being taken, has been taken? Rather than just yeah, because that's the thing. I mean, like, I sorry, it's yeah. Greg here. Um, I completely yeah, yeah. agree with Tony when he says that um, what we don't want is some kind of just um, data black hole where we're all just putting um, reams of information yeah. into one particular area, and that particular area, I mean, if it came under Health Watch or Health and Wellbeing Board or whatever, it's going to be like so much information, the resource to actually deal with it and use that information is going to be quite mm. vast. So I'm not I'm not saying we want that sort of system, but a system where you can show a patient your concern has been listened to and this is what happened as a result of it. Um, whether it was a concern raised with us or whoever mm. else, hospitals mm. or primary, secondary care, whatever, um, would be would be just like a really a nice like on a on a simple practical level would just be a really nice system to mm. have in the Bristol area to show other organisations how it can be done. Well, let's just take, you know, let, let's just work on that for another few minutes, shall we? Um, let's take a typical, and, and Dorset, I'm, I'm going to go to Dorset now as well, Martin. What, what, think, what would be a, a health community that we could have a practical conversation? Would it be a town like Bournemouth or Poole? Should we, was that just one way of seeing it? I mean, or a rural community? I, I, I don't know, but I suppose because I'm from a city and I spoke to someone from Poole Hospital this morning. Let, let, let's just take one of those towns um, in the same way as Bristol. And in it, I guess, in terms of providers, you might see yourself as having three or four very big ones. And then, of course, there's the 56 or 72 very small ones called GP practices. Is that a kind of rough summary? You know, there'll be one or two acute trusts, there'll be mental health trusts, be a community trust, maybe another player or two. Is that right, everybody? Am I getting sort of roughly the numbers right anyway? Um, and then, as, as we say, you know, 50, 60 or 70 GP surgeries. If we see those are those people, um, are there very practical things that any of you could say, actually, that could be done to do what we're talking about with Greg, about to, to make sure the information is passed on, but then also actioned and accountable? I mean, we're all builders of ideas here. Can you think of something practical? Okay, it's Tony here. I'll give Go you for a, an idea. I'll, I'll yeah. throw something in. Make an um, idea. Build it. I think this kind of integration has to follow integrated pathway development. Ah, because right. Because I think the problem for the patient is yes. we have very fractured pathways so that different organisations yeah. do different bits of things to us in our care, mm -hmm. either social care or health care. And I think whilst that continues, there's not much hope of ever getting integration around the response to the individual. Mm. So that's what I would say. Mm. However, what I think, irrespective of who wins the election or whatever government we have, it's mm -hmm. clear that integration is going to move forward and quite fast, I think. So I think, if you like, building on that likely move to integration of health and social care and integrated pathways, probably more organizations becoming horizontally or vertically aligned, depending which model mm. is going to be followed, yeah. then it may be possible to begin to say, if the patient has a seamless pathway, then the res they should have a seamless response. And it's either, I don't know what in the new models it'll be, it's either the lead provider or the lead commission or the, the something will be responsible for that. But I don't think we'll get there unless we have that, those kind of integrated pathways. That's my own thought. Mm -hmm. Any other views on that? Or it's great. Is that, are we talking about like a, a similar to Manchester sort of the Manchester yes. model? Yes. I mean, it's, it's that notion that what, what will drive us, and it's partly... Um, the inadequacy to current care but the pressures of money particularly is that organizations will have to see have to be able to deliver integrated care now that either means they're all part of one organization or they have very or they're commissioned to deliver separately but from 
separately but to the same pathway. Or what, I mean, there are lots of ways you can do it, but ultimately it means that, that the kind of Manchester model in various ways and in different parts of the country like differently, I think will be the way we'll go. I'm sure in Bristol in five or six years' time, I think it's possible there'll be one commissioning organisation of health yeah. and social care. I think that's perfectly possible, um, and it would be good if it did. So, And I think, in a way, our healthy participation infrastructure has to match and probably follow that integration, I think. It certainly could follow it. Um, do you want to wait that long, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> And I, I read the story. It's Greg otherwise, this is a otherwise, this is a Friday afternoon discussion. Greg, yeah. Um, <laughs> just because um, I definitely think that that is the way forwards, and I agree with Tony and Martin in that it should happen, and when will it happen is the question. Um, I mean, w even with it happening, we've obviously in Bristol already, there are some areas of care which are um, slightly integrated, like rehab centres, intermediate care, um, where council and um, providers, other providers are working together, but even then, it's still not necessarily like a, a, a doesn't mean that everything's joined up in that process. So, the, often it even makes it more fragmented. So, where the council are running part of the service, and for instance, Bristol Community Health are running part of the service, those two entities often seem, from my perspective, to hardly ever communicate, and people don't know exactly whose responsibility it is to do what. And, and I guess that just kind of comes with better you get at doing it, the more fluid the process gets. But it isn't, a, it's just to say that it's not an automatic thing that if you integrate the care, then you will have a joined up seamless service. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, if I can respond to that, Greg, I think you're quite right. I think the problem is that's actually not what I would describe as integrated care. That's mm. not yet what I think patients need. Yeah. And it's not what the drive will be where we will actually see the things. We, we won't in the future see the kind of nonsensical stuff we get at the moment where in one of our local hospitals we have people working in different teams from local authority and health sitting in the same room but not talking to each other about hospital discharge, which doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. You know, they even send emails to each other and they're sitting in the same room. Um, and it's bonkers. But I think we will be either forced by government or if we want to take it in our own hands, and that's the role of the Health and Wellbeing Board, we could lead that process in different parts of the country potentially quite quickly, I think. So it Let may not, Martin, hmm. be a a completely Friday afternoon discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm drawn to, um, I'll just chip in for a moment and then perhaps we'll move on to look at leadership, um, but I'm drawn to the, the sort of involvement I've had in the past in uh, end of life care and some of the you know, improving the processes of that and also in cancer briefly as well. Uh, and just, I'm just picking those out because they are emotional, uh, emotional areas if you like, but, but um, the sense I find of clinicians actually wanting to break the boundaries, regardless of the employer, is very, very strong. And I'm wondering if that's not necessary, but a really helpful um, kind of condition, if you like, of what we're talking about, is, is a, uh, a real sense of, being, of creating uh, an integrated pathway in a real way, Tony, you know, not, not, not just on paper and separate from it being integrated organisations because end of life care isn't done that way, it's done by charities, it's done by hospices, hospitals and so on, and GPs. Um, but, but if people, if clinicians feel as though they are working in a very integrated pathway, I think that's the, what would you call it, the um, rich ground for good participation, healthy participation and exchange of information to happen. Um, in other words, you know, if they're, if they're truly working for the patient in something they see as a pathway, then I think it's more likely to happen. It's a view. I don't know whether anybody wants to agree or disagree. Uh, not a condition, but a, but a, you know, a very, um, very positive bit of the fertilizer is already there. I think when that happens. So. Um, could I, I agree, um, Martin? Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to. Could I <laughs> Sorry. throw a? a Martin, different yeah. pebble into the pond, mm, please uh, do. Um, which I think um, sort of needs to be there and we sort of haven't got around to yet. Uh, if we're talking about um, experience and voice, there's actually an issue in practice 
about who people are willing to share their experience with and who mm. people are willing to talk to. Uh, it's a very, very common experience for us in Local Health Watch. The people who share their experiences with us um, do not want to, do not feel able to share it directly with the organization that has provided the service, provided the care for all sorts of reasons, not least, and we need to be honest about this, a perception, I'm careful to use the word, a perception that their care might be compromised if they did so. Now, I don't think um, anyone suggests that any uh, um, uh, um, NHS organisation uh, would have that intention, mm. uh, but as so often when we're dealing with people and with the general public, um, what matters is actually, in reality, perception. Yeah, uh, so it's a barrier. Than, Whether it's real barrier. or not, it's a barrier. And yeah. again and again and again, people have shared things with us and so they want to do so uh, and they, they, they want to keep their identity secret and they've said very openly, I'm sharing this with Healthwatch because um, I don't feel I can tell the hospital because uh, I don't want to compromise my care because I might need them in the future. And whatever we might think about that, and I think we all think that actually it will be far better if people do feel able at the earliest opportunity uh, to raise their concerns with the organisation concerned and get it sorted out, you know, at the, the local level and so on, that would, that would be far better. Yet nevertheless, uh, in very many cases, people feel that they can't do that. And we have to find a way through that. I was actually talking to a chief exec of an acute trust recently who said that she herself, when she had been a patient, hadn't been happy with the care she was receiving and she hadn't felt able to say anything because as a patient, she felt vulnerable. Mm. And I think there's some really important um, issues here. So one of the other roles of Local Health Watch that we don't hear much about but we think is very important uh, is that we, we operate uh, an information and signposting service. And, you know, we will always encourage people who come to us, you know, we'll always want to say, have you raised this with the hospital? Have you talked to pals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and gently encourage them to do so because, you know, to get things sorted out at the early opportunity at the local level is, is by far the best way of doing it. But um, very, very often, it, I find it very striking the number of times, which is the majority of times for us, people will say, oh, I don't feel able to do that. While they obviously want to share their experience, and in doing so, they want to feel that they're going to make a difference in some way. Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. that people very, very often say is, uh, almost if you like, it's sort of too late, it's happened to me, but I'd like to be able to think that me having raised it means that somebody else isn't going to have to go through that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shall we take all of that? We've got um, 10 minutes left um, before we round up. Shall we take all of that and if we like, if you would like to move on to um, the kind of issue around leadership and system leadership, that's a lot to talk about in 10 minutes, but has anybody got something new to say or a response that we haven't said already around the role of the various players and how we might have some form of system leadership without one of them having to be the hero. Any views or new thoughts or examples? Uh, it's Tony here from Bristol. If I chip in and start. Mm, I, please um, do. I can't think or imagine anybody to have a system leadership role other than the Health and Wellbeing Board, given the mm -hmm. sort of okay. configuration. So yes, yeah. But that begs lots of questions. I mean, in Bristol, our Health and Wellbeing Board is still struggling, I think, to you know, find its feet. Um, there are issues about councillors not being well supported to, to be very knowledgeable and sort of critical friends in their role. So I think the Health and Wellbeing Boards potentially have a, a leadership role. I just don't think, certainly in Bristol at the moment, it's fulfilling that. Mm -hmm. uh, and what one of the interesting things for me would be is if there are parts of the country where clearly the health and wellbeing boards are managing to fulfil that leadership role, it would be good to know and to know how they got to do that. Any responses? Well, I I just want to respond. Um, I mean, I think Health Watch, uh, with its um, kind of independent voice. Um, has a critical role, but with health and wellbeing board having um, 
a much more of an overview. So it, it's not just about the things we've talked about, patient experience, but it's also about healthy, uh, healthy living, you know, and good health and ill health prevention and working, targeting communities um, through JSNAs and, uh, you know, in our case, the black and minority ethnic community and so on. So I think I think the health and wellbeing boards have a, a quite a good, they're in a good position to have an overview. Uh, with, with health watches having a much more of a critical role as a kind of a more objective and outsiders who can hold people to account. So I think a model that would uh, sort of bring, conflate the two would be, for me, uh, a way forward. But I still have concerns that health watches um, themselves don't have often the capacity or the range or the reach to really um, be as effective as they could be. Um, I mean, Dorset might be exception, but so for, for me, in terms of system leadership, it's a combination of health watch and health and wellbeing boards having some infrastructure that would allow that kind of leadership, including you know some of the things that Tony raised this, this week with us um, in a paper he presented around patient leadership at our PEC meeting. Um, I think it raised lots of really interesting issues in terms of you know, how do we bring on a uh, public to be more proactive in in the whole design and delivery of um, health and social care, uh, which is not just a token view, but, you know, a much more inclusive uh, community. I don't know. I feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think it's, um, for me, in terms of infrastructure and leadership, the sort of systems leadership, um, I think health and wellbeing boards and health watch have a kind of critical role. So Tara, right. could, could, can I, sorry, so Jake, could, can I come in there and just say I, I think you've, you've raised some very interesting points there, and sort of interesting. You, I mean, I don't think you sort of meant it like this, but interesting. That you talk about health and wellbeing boards and health watch. Health watch is part of the health and wellbeing. Uh, board. Uh, well, I, know. I think that's one of the things that there's a sort of subconscious thing sometimes. Um, that health watch is a guest at the health and wellbeing board. No, the health watch rep at the health and wellbeing board is absolutely 100% the same a member as the director of adult services is. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I think I, I think I'd want to sort of lay down a challenge, if you like, to the rest of you, because you're right about um, health, different health watch across the country being in different places and having different capacities and so on. I think the challenge that we'd want to uh, lay down to the rest of you in the system is why not look at it in the, in terms of what can you do to support uh, and increase the efficacy, the capacity, the influence of your local health watch, because they, they do stand in a, in a unique position as um, independent bodies with statutory functions and statutory powers and a role to hold the system to um, account. And I think what I'd rather see is how can we, if that's what's needed, shore up and support um, our local health watch as part of the system and uh, as, uh, uh, if you like, in the system but not of the system, uh, uh, well, I think that's where I'm coming from, if you like. I think it's, it, it's an opportunity, just as in a way, how together can we support health and well-being boards because the sort of situation that, that Tony uh, um, um, expresses I think is a very common one um, across the country. Health and well-being boards are still trying to find their feet and in a way they're powerless, aren't they? They could be powerful in terms of influence, but in terms of actually being able to make something happen, um, they aren't powerful. Uh, uh, of course, after the election, looking at what different political parties think might be the role, um, that might change and they might be shored up. Yeah, so so you, you remind us there, Martin, that as far as I understand, the health and wellbeing boards have almost no executive powers, is that right? Or am well, I... No power and no funding. Uh, if, right. if, if you want to look at it like, if you want <laughs> to look at it like that, but but the people yeah, who sit, yeah, yeah. but the individual people who sit around the health and wellbeing board table, they have power to direct. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if if they collectively chose to exercise that power, actually mm -hmm. health and wellbeing boards could be very powerful. 
Can I just, and this is a very Bristol specific thing, sorry, Martin. No, no that's fine. No, we, our, we're, only two, we're only in two uh, places, <laughs> Bristol and Dorset. Yeah. No, this was Martin, our Martin in, in Dorset. Ah, uh, oh, I see, yeah, yeah. Other Martin. Yeah. Um, yeah. That our, we have an elected mayor in Bristol, and he's chosen now to chair the Health and Wellbeing Board with the CCG chair. And it's interesting because obviously, as an elected mayor, he has executive functions and, sorry, executive powers which he can just do things basically and it's interesting that he's and this has only happened quite recently he's chosen to chair the health and wellbeing board which i think is an indication of where that board's powers and influence mm. may increase in the city but i appreciate that not many parts mm. of the country at the moment have the elected mayor system so it's a bit mm. a bit sort of specific that example no, it's a very interesting one, Tony. I, I listened, I went to the Mayor's Question Time just to um, find out what that was all about. Uh, and one of the questions from the floor was a health issue from uh, about maternity um, support, support for maternity services. And in the end, the Mayor in the hot seat said, I am co-chair. Um, you can't ask anything more of me than that. Like, you know, that's, that's, if you want something to happen, I'm the Mayor, he implied. I'm the man, you know, you're here telling me and I'm chairing this board. So I think in the Bristol sense, Bristol area, there is a sense in which an individual such as the mayor could um, be quite powerful in moving things forward. Um, but Martin, um, well, we've only got um, three or four minutes left, but Martin, um, yourself in Dorset, um, your, how, how close is it to the vision that you've discussed with us um, in with the Health and Wellbeing Board. Is it as powerful and as um, showing as much leadership as you'd wish? Or, mm -hmm. I think I'd say that um, like every Health and Wellbeing Board, and both the Health and Wellbeing Boards in Dorset are, uh, sorry to use the jargon, but are still on a journey and still um, mm -hmm. coming to feel their way and to feel their role. So I think, you know, uh, um, as, as we might expect, we're still sort of only two years in, actually, aren't we, uh, since they came into being, you know, as statutory bodies, um, still finding their way and flexing their muscles. One thing I think that we from the Health Watch perspective would say, and I know this is um, something that a perspective that's shared by other Health Watch colleagues around the country, is that from our perspective, they're very, in quotes, local authority. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean that they are obviously legally um, committees of the um, local authority mm -hmm. and so on. But nevertheless, uh, I think from our uh, um, standpoint, we would say they're pretty much um, in the thrall of a local authority um, way of doing things, if you like, uh, which from our perspective is sometimes very um, restrictive. And mm -hmm. um, we and colleagues from the voluntary sector who are in some cases members of health and wellbeing boards as well, I think very often find that um, quite um, uh, um, uh, difficult and a bit of a straitjacket and um, not very progressive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I'm going to have to draw us all to a close in the next two minutes. Um, by the way, I've just had an email from Jane, <laughs> Jane in Brighton and Hove. Um, is she, she was very, very delayed and didn't think it was sensible to join us very late. So apologies from her. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to um, drop the subject in the next minute because uh, I wouldn't mind just asking each of you in the order on the screen here, um, starting with Greg, um, just, just to say that we're not talking about summarizing our hour's discussion, but is there an action or thought we can have either <laughs> from today's discussion. Very briefly, just a one-liner um, before we draw to a close. Greg, any any other um, thoughts or actions? Yeah, yes, I can just um, yeah. feed all our, our service user opinions to George Ferguson in the future. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll email and send it straight to him. Um, but no, but it does it does sound interesting. I I wasn't aware that George um, was now chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, so maybe that is a, a good way for us to look in the future for, because I know they, they have a um, kind of part of their role is to consult with the public anyway, um, whether they do that through Health Watch or through their own areas. So maybe that is something which, um, a tool to gather feedback and to share learning and that sort of thing. So yeah, no, yeah. I, yeah that sounds quite positive. 
Mm. And uh, we've also come full circle here because when Martin and I discussed and used the phrase no heroic leaders, we are actually vesting some of our interest there in somebody who's quite a charismatic uh, personal leader. <laughs> um, Tara, any, any actions? I'd like to hear an action or just a reflection or thought. Yeah, no, it's been helpful listening to some of this uh, discussion. I mean, for me, um, I went to a really exciting leadership event yesterday in Bristol for where we're trying to get public sector across the board to take on the Race Equality Manifesto and demands within that. And I came away from that feeling quite inspired because um, Martin Jones, our, our chair, was with me and he, you know, promised to take some leadership role around around that manifesto. And I kind of think that we in Bristol and Tony's work quite Tony James works quite closely with us on our people PEC, what our patient public involvement, um uh, equalities and communication committee and we've been having some interesting dis- discussion about patient leaders and all sorts of things. So I think this conversation made me feel more inspired around how we might take some of these uh, issues for, uh, forward uh, around system leadership and, and, and the role of Health and Wellbeing Board and Health Watch. And our relationship with Health Watch in Bristol is good. So it's made me think, yeah, we can, we can have some more constructive um, discussions uh, about how we may move forward. So I haven't got a solution, but I do feel no. a bit more inspired after this discussion, actually. Well, nice to hear that, Tara. <laughs> Thank you. And Tony and then Martin, just quick thought or um, action. A quick, just responding to an earlier point you made, Martin, about clinicians wanting to own and make and create integrated pathways. Mm. And just... I think trying what it's starting to make me think is what we have to try and marry up is the structural move to integration and mm. um, non sort of broken pathways with work with clinicians to and that's got to run in parallel. So that's just begun to set something thinking in my mind. Mm. Yes, thank you. And and Greg representing a community organisation, you know, uh, uh, we haven't got an acute trust on the phone, but. Yeah, that's an example, isn't it? Thank you. And and Martin, finally. I think just uh, at this, um, I think uh, I've, I've got no great actions to offer. Um, I think I always feel at the end of these things that it's really good then to go away and let it sort of all sort of go around in your mind and things begin to coalesce and you sort of want to sort of come back to it in a little while, don't you? But uh, I suppose a, a general reflection of that, I think it's really good and the more opportunities uh, we can all have to share in whatever ways that, that, that there are, um, we being um, all of us um, uh, different players in the system, if you like, because we've, we've each got something to bring, and it's, and it's all valid, um, but it's different. And I think for us it's often really it's about perspectives. You know, in a sense, experience and voice is really about perspective. It's about understanding others' perspectives. So um, for us, we're, we're great believers in being... Um, deliberative, if you like, in you know, sort of getting the whole system, as it were, in the room and deliberating together and listening to and learning from and understanding each other's perspectives and then seeing how together uh, we can agree on a way forward. I suppose the jargon for that is co-production. Mm, mm, thank you, Martin. Um, I'm going to round us up. Um, I'm going to say... Uh, I'm going to say thank you to somebody who isn't here. That's Emma Cooper, who is Martin's equivalent in Wiltshire, who I met early on uh, a year ago, uh, who kind of inspired this discussion in a way because um, she also in Healthwatch are uh, attempting to work with the local authority on a shared understanding of what engagement is. Um, So it came from there. So thank you to Emma, who isn't with us. Um,